friends, today is a good day. We are going to be talking all about the history of Maserati cars, and we are going to talk about this 1982 Maserati Quattroporte. <laughs> sports cars, odd cars, basically you name it, and the history of those car manufacturers. So if you're interested in that, certainly subscribe. All right, now let's talk about the men behind the vehicle. Mr. Maserati would have seven sons, and luckily five of them would develop a severe fascination with speed, and that would be where we get Maserati, right? So you had, of those sons, you had Carlo, Bindo, Alfieri, Ernesto, Ettore, and then you had Mario. Now Mario actually didn't participate that much in the automotive scene, but he would play a significant role in Maserati, and I'll get to that later. When Maserati first started, they weren't building cars, all right? They were actually making spark plugs. And it wouldn't be until 1926 that they built their first vehicle, and that would be the Tipo 26. And really, the Tipo 26 hit the gates real fast, okay? Alfieri drove it the first year it was produced in 1926, and he took first at the Targa Florio. And it's important to remember that these were really those exciting and dangerous days of the Le Mans and Millemiglia and Targa Florio. And now here is an interesting racing tidbit for you. Maserati is the only Italian country to win the Indy 500. And that happened in 1939 and 1940. Now, the Maserati brothers actually would be kind of so absorbed with racing that they did not pay attention to actually selling their vehicles. And that would be a little bit of the theme of early Maserati is that they weren't paying attention to the bottom line, they were paying attention to the thrill of the race. I can respect that. Well, now while that you can understand putting passion over pursuit of money, unfortunately that would eventually lead to financial problems and then coupled with the passing of Alfieri in 1932, within five years all of the Maserati brothers would sell their shares of the company. They would sell to the very wealthy Orsi family, and the Orsi family would move Maserati manufacturing to Modena, Italy. However, the brothers would stay on. They signed a 10-year contract continuing to work for the Orsi family. All right, it's beer 30, guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. It's so tasty. Devil's Backbone by Real Ale. It's delicious. It's got 8% ABV. It's a Belgian style triple and it is so tasty. <laughs> Backtrack to Mario Maserati, the artist of the family. His pivotal role in Maserati would be the creation of their famous logo, the Trident. And this was inspired by the Neptune Fountain in Bologna, Piazza Maggiore, their hometown. And the trident in Neptune is really representative of strength and vigor. Makes sense when you're making race cars, right? And the trident logo would first be used on the Tipo 26. All right, now at this point, the Orsi family owns Maserati and unfortunately, World War II hits. And just like every other car manufacturer, they stop producing cars and they start producing the war effort whichever way they can and for whichever side they're on, right? Now, fun little fact, 
they still had a little side project car going on, which was a fierce competition to create a V16 town car for Mussolini before Ferdinand Porsche, a Volkswagen, created one for Hitler. They didn't actually succeed with creating that V16 town car, and luckily, Hitler didn't succeed in taking over the world. All right, now, interesting race facts. Maserati took victories at the first F1 races in Nice and Geneva, okay? And during those early days, it was mostly Maserati and Alfa Romeo fiercely competing for pole positions. And then in the 1950s, in the mid-1950s, 56 and 57, you would see Ferrari and Maserati fiercely competing in the F1 scene. Now this competition within Formula One pissed off Enzo Ferrari so much that when the president of Italy drove up to visit with Enzo, in a Maserati, Enzo refused to meet with him. And now we would see some major changes with Maserati at the end of 1957. They would have started losing investors and they also withdrew from the racing scene after the tragedy of Guidizola at the Mili Miglia. Now, that wasn't even caused by a Maserati car. It was actually a Ferrari driven by Alfonso de Portego, okay? And the tragedy would cost the lives of 12 people and it would also lead to manslaughter charges being brought against into Ferrari. Those would later be dismissed. And so with endings do come new beginnings. And in 1957, Maserati would produce their first grand touring vehicle, the Maserati 3500 GT. And that would be the first in a long line of luxury grand touring vehicles. And with that, let's go ahead and segue, boom, right to the Quattroforte. Found the one, you should never give her up. I think it's the way life changes when in love, yeah. I surround my soul with the positivity. That's why I don't worry about the things that I don't see, yeah. These days I don't worry about much. I think we should have some more fun. I still dream about the days when we were young. I'll take a hit and still finish and run, yeah, yeah. about the Maserati Quattroporte. Now I have a 1982 uh, third generation 4.9 right behind me and it's quite lovely. The Quattroporte is one of Italy's definitive grand luxury vehicles. All right. Now I am actually going to kind of summarize this a bit for you so I don't lose anybody's interest. But the earlier generations of the Quattroporte were heavily influenced by Citroën, the French car manufacturer. Why that is, is because Citroën owned Maserati for a period of time. Now, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but uh, when the third generation came out, Maserati was now owned by the supreme badass Alejandro de Tomaso of Pantera de Tomaso, Mangusta, and also he owned Moto Guzzi at a period of time. Alejandro de Tomaso was kind of this badass entrepreneur, businessman, and rancher out of Argentina. So basically, Alejandro de Tomaso was a badass. Mm -hmm. Now, he was a badass that actually did not like Citroën at all. And he removed all the influences that Citroën had on the Quattroporte in the third generation. Now, the gentleman that owns this Quattroporte is one of my dear friends, mentors, and massive automobile collector. It is George Finley. And when George first got the Quattroporte, immediately he, my dad, and our good friend David Rohde promptly went to 
making some performance tweaks, and one of them included re-engineering the airflow for the four Weber dual-throated carburetors. And one of my favorite stories about this Quattroporte, and I have had this car in my life for a long time, actually. I spent a lot of my teenage summers while grounded uh, making money by detailing cars, and this was one of my favorite interiors to clean uh, and, de and condition, and I think you know why, all right? That leather and that wood. Uh, so anyways, but one of my favorite stories about this Maserati Quattroporte is a pretty good one, all right? So George somehow cautiously stops the speedometer in this vehicle. And why he did that was because when he is traveling from Corpus Christi to the Davis Mountains, which is 10 hours by car, he wanted to go the speeds that he wanted to go without his wife ever knowing about it. feasted your eyes upon is the legendary Maserati 4.9 liter dual overhead cam V8 capable of 280 horsepower. With a Chrysler Torque Fly 3-speed automatic transmission and four Weber twin choke carburetors. Now I would absolutely be remiss if I did not mention the epic and prolific designer that style of the Quattroporte, okay? Now that prolific badass was Giorgetto Giugaro. And he's the same mastermind behind the BMW M1, the Lotus Esprit, which you can watch a video of mine of that up there, uh -huh. the Mangusta de Tommaso, both the Iso, Revolta, and Grifo, and the 5000 GT by Maserati. So this guy is extremely talented. All right, guys, I hope you had fun, because obviously I did. And if you haven't already subscribed, do hit the subscribe button right there and then the bell icon so that you can be notified anytime I make another car video. Until next time, cheers!